Well, this semester, our focus in chapel is going to be on mission together. We have a glorious mission. It's printed up there on the wall under the authority of God's inerrant word. We exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. We are on that mission together. We have core commitments as a God-centered, Bible-saturated, church-based, globally-minded, historically-rooted, highly relational, remarkably affordable school. We want to lean into those commitments and and unpack them and, and reflect on what God's Word has to teach us, because this is our authority as Christians, as a school. And so you're going to hear this semester from your teachers and some of your trustees, and I'm excited about what God has for us in this series. And today, as the president, I get to go first, and I chose seeing and savoring Jesus Christ. And I love that theme. And I also struggled on wh- which text to focus on. And I'll admit, I actually wrote multiple outlines for this message and then changed and then changed again. And I landed on Luke 24. And I'm excited about that. We love Jesus Christ. We marvel at what Jonathan Edwards called the diverse excellencies in Jesus Christ. He is majestic and meek. He is powerful, yet patient. He's the exalted sovereign and the humble servant. He's the judge and also our mediator. He's the lion and the lamb. He's the eternal God and the perfect man. He's the suffering savior the risen Lord, the great high priest, the coming king, the glorious bridegroom, and our all-satisfying treasure. We confess these and other precious truths about our Lord Jesus. And sometimes we pray, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Sometimes the darkness seems nearer to us. The the clouds obscure our sight of this Christ. And we need fresh reminders. We need to be stirred once again to remember who Christ is and who we are in him. When life storms leave us disoriented and in the dark, So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke 24. It's a remarkable account of the risen Lord revealing himself to two disoriented disciples on the road to Emmaus. This story has much to teach us, I think, about seeing and savoring our Savior as we face questions and doubts and as we read God's word. We're gonna consider our passage, Luke 24, verses 13 through 35 in three parts. First open questions, then the open book, and then open eyes. Open questions, open book, and open eyes. Let's read together, beginning in verse 13. That day, Two of them were going on a villi- to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about what these things, these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. 
Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in these last days? And he said to them, what things? They said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who is mighty, a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they'd even seen a vision of angels who said he was still alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they didn't see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is towards evening and the day is far now spent. So he went in to stay with them. When they were at table with him, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word this afternoon. This is a familiar passage and it is packed with truth that we need to land fresh on our hearts that we might see and savor our Savior afresh. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Many great stories include a journey or a quest. Think of Bilbo's travels there and back again in The Hobbit, or Bunyan's classic allegory of the Christian life, Pilgrim's Progress. A lot of the action happens on the way, on the road. Journeys are a prominent theme throughout Scripture as well. God calls and instructs, guides and tests, disciplines and provides for his people on the road. Jesus' parables often feature a journey. Think of the rebellious son who sets off for the far country. Jesus also calls his followers to follow him quite literally, on the road. Our passage involves a journey. It's set on the road. Two disciples, one named Cleopas uh, later in the passage, the other we don't know who it is, just a disciple. And we meet them on the road. And this is a hard walk. It's not that the terrain is too difficult for them, They've probably walked longer journeys, about seven miles from Jerusalem to the village, but their hearts are heavy because of what just happened in Jerusalem. In verse 13, it begins that very day, which takes us back to verses 1 through 12. That very day is Resurrection Sunday, the first day of the week, as chapter 1 says the first day of the Jewish week, the first day that Jesus is alive again. And earlier that day, 
women have gone to visit the tomb and they've seen the stone rolled away and they've met angels who have testified that he's not here, he's alive. And they remember Jesus' teaching about what would happen on the third day. And they go to run and, and, and tell the apostles and they find skepticism. The text says that the apostles do not believe them. Peter goes to inspect the gravesite for himself, and he returns home amazed. It's just like the woman said. These witnesses see and speak about the empty tomb, but it is our troubled disciples, Cleopas and his friend, that are going to see and speak to the risen Lord. Let's consider verses 13 through 24 under the heading open questions. Multiple times Luke emphasizes that these travelers are talking as they walk. But they're not just chit-chatting, making small talk. They are engaged in a deep discussion, or you could even say a debate. The word discussing in verse verse 15 could also be translated arguing or debating. Might suggest that they have some difference of perspective, difference of opinion. They're not sure what to make of it. What are they trying to sort out? They're trying to sort out, according to verse 14, all these things that had happened. What things? As they're going to explain to Jesus, these things are the shocking events that had taken place just a few days before in Jerusalem. Jesus' arrest, trial, and execution outside the city. These friends meet another traveler in verse 15. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And yet we read something surprising. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. This is ironic. They are talking about Jesus, and Jesus shows up, and they don't notice. Why don't they recognize him? I don't think it's because Jesus appears in disguise, like Athena showing up in the Odyssey, pretending to be somebody else. The, the, the passive voice of the verb were kept is important here. It means that someone or something is preventing them from grasping the true identity of the traveler. Who is responsible for keeping their spiritual sight from apprehending Jesus? Well, earlier in the gospel, we read that the disciples similarly do not grasp the true identity of, uh, of, of Jesus and his mission. The, the meaning of what he has said about, about his coming death and resurrection it is concealed from them. It is hidden from them. They understand the words, but don't really grasp what it all, what it all entails. In Luke 10, Jesus praises the Father who conceals and reveals his will to his people. And I think that's the clue that helps us understand who's responsible for keeping these travelers from apprehending their walking companion. It is Jesus, it is God himself who prevents them from immediately recognizing the risen Lord on the road. This sets up the reversal that will come later in the story. Jesus asks the disciples, what are you talking about? Can I join in? I'm interested. And they stop and they look sad or gloomy. You could render that word. Ironically, Their true comfort is standing right before them. The light of the world is inches away from the darkness that is surrounding them, and they can't break through and see it. Maybe some of you have felt that way before. 
That's where we find Cleopas and his friend. They are weighed down by heavy hearts. Yet in their distress, they don't change the subject when Jesus asks them the question. They don't start making small talk about the weather. They dare to share with this stranger the news from Jerusalem that has rocked their world. What do they say? Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Do you feel the ache in we had hoped? That is a fitting summary of their shattered dreams. Their hope had died on a Roman cross outside the city. It was over for them. This is the walk of defeat back from the big city to the village. That's why they are so down. Their hope has died. Or so they thought. Yet open questions remain. What do they make of this strange news that the women brought back from the grave site? What do they make of this report that there are angels and an empty tomb and even apostles coming to verify it? Notice also what they say in verse 21. Yes, and besides this, it is also now the third day since these things had happened. It's like they they know there's something about the third day. Why is that important? Well, twice earlier in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has told his disciples that he would be killed and then rise on the third day. And earlier in chapter 24, the angel said to the bewildered women, he is not here, but he is risen. Remember what he said while he was still in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified, and on the third day rise. And then Luke says, they remembered. The women remembered these words. There was recognition The pieces clicked together. It made sense. The empty tomb and Christ's words and the angel's witness, he's alive. It's just what he said. That's why they were so excited running back to share the news. So Cleopas and his friends have heard this. They know on one level that Jesus promised to rise on the third day. They've even heard reliable testimony from firsthand eyewitnesses that the tomb is empty and that supernatural beings are giving them information about Jesus being alive. Yet doubts are lingering. Questions remain. The horrors of Friday still haunt them. And they fail to remember Christ's promise. And so they can't recognize the living Lord who walks with them. This leads us to point two, the open book. Jesus has asked them two brief questions thus far in the story, but now he addresses these travelers pointedly, beginning in verse 25. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? We might expect a gentle word of comfort here from Jesus, but instead we have a word of confrontation. Oh, foolish ones. This is like Paul talking to the Galatians that have been bewitched by false teaching. Oh, foolish ones. 
What's happening? The good doctor has diagnosed them with sickness of the heart, not of the head here. They're slow of heart. Do you see that in verse 25? All the pieces are there. They've just rehearsed them. But they haven't yet quickened in faith to grab hold, to put it all together. It's a slowness of heart. Jesus doesn't correct them here for their skepticism over the women's testimony, though they should have believed it. He doesn't rebuke them for failing to recognize who he really is. The first order problem is that they have not believed Moses and, the, and, and, and Isaiah. The law and the prophets. What is written. They haven't, they haven't believed their Bible. The rhetorical question, wasn't it necessary, gets at this idea of the divine necessity. The necessity according to the scriptures. That phrase is unpacking what Jesus says in the previous verse, all that the prophets have spoken. That is what's necessary. Jesus says, according to that standard, it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise. Haven't you read it? Haven't you seen it? Now look in verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wow. Wouldn't you like to have the extended edition of that verse? That might be helpful for biblical theology class. We might wonder which texts Jesus turned to as he taught these doubting disciples. This summary statement, though, is concise yet comprehensive. This is exactly what Luke wanted to land on us. We don't need all those examples here. We need the reality, the summary the definitive claim that Jesus covers Moses and all the prophets and is interpreting all the scriptures with a singular focus on himself, saying, it's about me. This is no ordinary teacher. This isn't just a good person with wise ideas. He is making a claim that no other human being should make. It's all about me. And he's right. While, G while Luke doesn't here give us lots of specific examples, the gospel elsewhere provides ample illustration for Jesus' teaching here from the law and the prophets. Just in Luke... We read that Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. He is this dishonored prophet. He is the last Passover lamb. He is the suffering servant, the anointed one, David's son and David's Lord. His resurrection on the third day resembles Jonah's three days in the fish's belly and recalls Hosea's prophecy that Israel would be raised on the third day. We could add other examples where the apostles who sat at Jesus' feet are interpreting the scriptures like they learned from their master teacher. The point is that Jesus opens up the scriptures. He unlocks their meaning and clarifies how they all concern him. The long-awaited Messiah, the suffering Savior, the risen Lord. We've considered their open questions and Christ's response as he opens the book. And this leads to our final scene, the open eyes. Beginning in verse 28. They arrive at the village, the disciples who still don't recognize Jesus even after the greatest teaching session of all time on the road 
urge their fellow traveler to stay the night with them. And they gather at the table for their meal. And the invited guest surprisingly assumes the role of the host. Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. For careful Bible readers, that wording should sound familiar. Because it occurs twice previously in the Gospels. Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and gives bread on two occasions besides this. The feeding of the 5,000 and at the Last Supper. In Luke 9, the broken bread, the multiplied loaves satisfy the hungry crowd in the wilderness. In Luke 22, the broken bread memorializes Jesus' sacrifice in the covenant meal. And here, in Luke 24, the broken bread reveals the risen Lord. We read in verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Once again, we have the passive verb that's very important. Were opened, here signals divine activity. They are not opening their own eyes. They're not removing their own blinders. They need Jesus to do that. They need spiritual sight, which is a divine gift. And as soon as they recognize Jesus, he's gone. Like, wait, wait. I don't know if he left the bread or took that with him. He's gone. He vanished. Jesus does this several times in his resurrection appearances. He appears and he's gone. He'll do it again later in Luke 24. But he's not a ghost. He's not a spirit. Remember, he's been walking on the road with them. He's been eating bread. In a few verses, he's going to eat fish. He's going to say, look at my hands. Look at my side. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like this. You know, past the fish. But he can come and go as, as the, the risen Lord. And here he does that. Boom, he's gone. Why does Jesus wait until this moment at the table to open their eyes? We might have expected that it would have been in verses 25 through 27 as he is unpacking the scriptures in light of himself. Yet somehow the pieces haven't all been connected yet. It is not until the table that the blinders go off. Why is that? One clue is the wording in verse 31, which has a close Old Testament parallel. Back to the first book of the Bible, there's another pair whose eyes are opened and they knew. It's in the garden. Adam and Eve, after they take food and eat it, their eyes are opened and they knew that they were naked. Here in Luke, their eyes were opened and they knew him. In both texts, people take and eat food from one they don't recognize, and their eyes are opened. The first meal in the garden brings regret and shame, while the second meal at the table brings revelation and wonder. The first Adam forgets God's commands, and death results. The second Adam fulfills God's commands and overcomes death. By revealing himself in this way through a meal, the risen Lord is not only proving his humanity, but he's also reversing the consequences of Adam's rebellion. 
starting to overcome that, overturn that, that sting. Adam and Eve's eyes are open to sin and its consequences, and the disciples' eyes are open to see and savor their Savior. Look at verse 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the Scripture? Their hearts, once burdened with doubts, now burn with delight. They have seen the living Lord. They will report back to their friends, the Lord has risen indeed. Notice the double opening in these verses. We see another example later in verse 45. Christ opens their eyes so that they recognize him. And he opens the scriptures so that they grasp how he fulfills God's promises. The risen Christ reveals himself. The living word illuminates the written word. The disciples behold Christ's glory as he breaks bread and fulfills the book. They see and savor their Savior, and then they speak of him to others. He is risen indeed. Open questions, open book, open eyes. That's the progression in this passage. We see the Lord Jesus draw near to his downcast disciples. He confronts their doubts, expounds the scriptures, and makes himself known at the table. He is the risen Savior, the master teacher, the gracious host. We see the disciples move from blindness to sight, from doubt to confidence, from gloom to gladness. This narrative reminds us how our Lord Jesus showed himself in a unique way to two disciples on the day of his resurrection. But God's word also encourages and challenges us today as students, staff, and friends of Bethlehem College and Seminary to see and savor Jesus in our studies and in our trials. Students, as you study, pray for illumination. You could pray with the psalmist, open my eyes that I might see wondrous things out of your law. Come to God's word, not just to fulfill academic assignments or check off a religious duty. Quiet time, check. Come to receive daily grace from the living God. Come to rekindle your trust in his promises. Come to see and savor your Savior in all of Scripture. And as you study languages and literature and history and philosophy and more, remember that in Christ all of these things hold together. Trust and treasure Jesus in your studies and in your troubles. Hold on to hope. As I drove downtown this morning, many of the buildings were hidden by a thick fog. Did any of you see it? It's like, I know the IDS tower's right over there, but it's not visible. It would normally be visible this time of day. It's covered up, still there, but hidden from view. And for the travelers in Luke 24, and for some of us, we're dealing with a fog, a fog of doubt or distress that might keep us from seeing as clearly as we ought, as we want to. The disciples on the road said, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. And that wasn't a misguided hope. He was the one to redeem Israel. He is the Redeemer. He is the one that they had been waiting for. The fog was just keeping them from seeing the fulfillment. Their hope was alive and staring them in the face. Even though they couldn't 
recognize him, the reality was still there. The reality was not determined by their doubts. The reality overcame their doubts and disappointments and discouragement. Perhaps some of you are starting this new academic year weighed down by questions or doubts or disappointments. Might feel hard to hope right now. May Luke 24 renew your hopes that our Savior who walked out of the tomb on the third day, just as he promised, who revealed himself at the table to two discouraged disciples, will return as conquering king, as righteous judge, as resplendent bridegroom. One day, faith will be sight. One day, there will be no weariness to call for rest. No place for any energy but praise. One day we shall rest and see and see and love and love and praise, as Augustine once wrote. This is our goal. This is what we've been waiting for. And until that day when faith becomes sight, hold on to hope and see and savor our risen Savior and returning King. Let's pray, then we'll sing. Oh Lord, would you once again tune our hearts to sing your praise? Would you drive the dark of doubt away from every heart? Would you give us fresh glimpses of the glory and goodness of our Savior, our Lord, our King Jesus? Would you help us to hold on to hope as a school community? We look to you. We long for you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.